Tonight is the Great American Pizza Party. Get your orders in early because there may be a rush. There may be a line. Who knows? But I'm recommending that you get out and get your pizza or have it delivered. Wash it down with bleach and then it'll be really an unusual taste. No, I'm not saying that. Anyway, it's a campaign, the Great American Takeout campaign we did. My Chinese, my Chinese restaurant opens uh, on the 19th, whenever that is. I guess that's on Easter night for us, Pascha. But um, I'm counting the days for the good Chinese. So uh, if, if you know a governor, we're not going to prevent infection. We're not going to stop a virus. We never have. We haven't the technology. We need to manage it so that we don't get overwhelmed, but send the young people back to work. So, and on that note, let's go on to number two. I'm going to keep saying it. There's, um, there's a war going on about ice cream trucks, which are franchisees and are kind of, you know, outside the limits of, you know, California can't shut down the electricity and water to the ice cream truck. <laughs> L.A. threatened that. Um, and so there's some, in some cases, still out driving around. Um, the Mr. Softy franchise says they'd rather they stayed home, but it's really up to the drivers. And so the drivers are serving up drumsticks while wearing gloves and face coverings to the few customers that will risk it all for a strawberry shortcake pop. I might, but we don't have them out in the country where I live. So um, some activists want to put drivers in the cone of shame. In Philadelphia, one activist is staging a guerrilla-style war against rogue ice cream trucks. Okay? Asteria Vivis... Tracks down trucks, photographs the drivers, sends their info to local officials. It's a tale of two panics. Drivers are desperate to stay financially stable, while residents are desperate to protect their neighborhoods from infection. Who wins? Hard to say. And you're never going to know. This is the interesting paradox is that we keep saying, with more data, we'll make a decision. There's never enough data to make a decision. Scott Adams the other day said, we need to not compare the infection rate and the death rate now with past, with past pandemics. We need to think about what it could be, what it might be, and compare that. Well, you can't compare data in the future with data in the past because you don't have the data in the future yet, Scott. And you know that, and I know that, and that's why there'll never be enough data to make a decision, which is an old talk I gave years and years ago, which brings me to another point that I want to bring up. Let's go over here to this one. I wanted to do a little bit of homage to my friend and colleague, John Worth, Ph.D. of Woodworker Supply of New Mexico. John, as I said yesterday, I just found out he died. I did find his obituary, and it turned out he died March 9th, it seems. I'd been calling him monthly for the last year or two. We were supposed to do a, um, a speech together at, uh, at Namoa in the fall of, I don't know, 2017 or 18, and uh, John couldn't make it. He'd been out of the hospital for a while, but just decided he couldn't travel. So, um, I kept calling. I, I, you know, when he accepted the, my invitation, he said he had just gotten out of the hospital that day. So, I caught him on a good day, and apparently there were not as many good days because I never heard back from him except to say that he couldn't make it. Um, but I wanted to talk about, John flew me out once. <laughs> this is crazy, but he flew me out once for lunch out to New Mexico because he decided I was one of the smarter people in the world. John has a PhD in aeronautical engineering. All his coursework was for aeronautical engineering. But he convinced, uh, and that was at Arizona State, I believe, or Arizona University. But anyway, 
he did all his coursework and then he went into uh, junk mail and he decided he liked it because of the analytical capabilities and so John um, John convinced the University of New Mexico which is where he founded his company uh, to to let him do a dissertation on mail delivery and how to analyze the the drop curves and discern the true curve that was um, that was generated, and he did it with nonlinear uh, nonlinear math. And I said, John, you know, and and we we we've done we've done that with he, one of the things he flew me out. To, to talk about was how the hockey stick curve, there's a few good lists, there's a few um, early orders, time and performance tend to work similarly, which is an interesting paradox, I would say. And so if you rank the lists, the performance, and it doesn't just list, it's the performance on any metric almost, uh, you know, professional golf uh, w winnings, stuff like that. Uh, it's just amazing that this, you know, Pareto principle always exists. You rank your customers, rank almost anything. And there'll be a few good ones, and then they'll drop off, and then they'll go flat after that. This is time, though. This is not that curve, but I'm just going to use it to, to talk about. So John said, you can't, and he said, what, what everybody wants to do is they want to cut off the tail and say, we're only going to mail the, the best lists. And guess what happens? What happens is you cut your circulation to nothing, and the same curve appears in the next mailing, which is something for the coronavirus people to think about. We think that by closing down everything, somehow we'll change the fundamentals of that 80-20. 80% of people, no problem. They get it. They may not even know they get it. They may think they have a cold right but 20 percent get it seriously of that 20 percent about 20 percent need hospitalization of that 20 percent about 20 percent die it's really amazing nature has its way right so let's take the low risk people since you can't ch and this is what i said to john i said john okay that's great you got nonlinear math and you can't change the pareto principle it affect it it relates to the size of stars for heaven's sakes that big stars tend to accumulate more mass and get bigger faster than small stars they don't catch up when i was in junior high i was playing basketball and i was pretty good um but i didn't make the starting team I was maybe the sixth man on the team, or seventh maybe. And but what, by the time I got into the game, I got in with all the other scrubs in garbage time, so I couldn't even really demonstrate that I was very much better than they were because they didn't know what plays to run. They really weren't paying any attention whatsoever. And so I learned that you don't work your way from the seventh man up to to a starter because they get more game experience. So I took up skiing, and I got pretty good at that. I got my name in Ski Magazine. Anyway, so there's always this principle. So what do we do? Well, we take the ones that are least likely to be impacted by it, to develop the herd immunity, to get out there and, and run the ice cream trucks. And maybe we let 16-year-olds do it. You know, maybe we let 16-year-olds... When I tried to hire the son of one of my employees... To do, to do programming and web development work, we found out that the state of Wisconsin prohibits that because it wasn't restaurant work or, or, or picking crops. That that sixteen-year-olds could do that, but they couldn't work in an air-conditioned office with free snacks in their own little cubicle. That was hazardous duty or something for 16 year olds so we ended up making him an employee of his dad and giving his dad a little raise which was I guess legal anyway so I said to John so John said you can't make this you can't change this that's the truth and I said John instead of so instead of trying to project a nonlinear curve 
let's just slam it into the y-axis, which is what really happens if you average out the performance. You can't identify beforehand the high risk or the high benefit customers, not entirely. But you might be able to minimize the number of low benefit customers you're going to mail. And that's kind of the way we win. We win against everybody. And we had a new we had new results this week. You know, the overall the overall three tests generated oh my gosh. Something like on small mailings. I better not say. I don't know, but it was like a 200% return on investment. It was tens of thousands of dollars of extra profit. Oh, it was more than that on a small mailing. So when we get on the other side of this, the fundamentals are going to still apply. You need someone who understands nonlinear math. And John and I used to talk about this forever. And he, he was the only one who let me read his PhD thesis in the direct marketing industry, which talks, which says a little about his, his trust level, too, of the industry and of myself. And I think that was very good. So you're still going to need to figure out which customers to mail. And the longer you've been in business, the more interesting that gets. I hate to say it. The longer you've been in business, you think you know everything, but it's harder to figure it out. You need more variables. So John taught me the bathtub model. He said, rather than try to flag every customer, like the lifetime value people want to do. They want to keep track of when a customer comes in, which isn't that hard because we can tell if they're new to file. That's pretty easy. The hard part, and the more you open the spigot, the more you'll grow. But the problem is once they get into the active buyer group, we can tell they have gone, they haven't bought in a while, but we can't tell how they feel about you. We can't tell if they're dormant, really dormant, or only look dormant. As I said about Land's End, this is a Land's End shirt, Land's End fleece. I skipped out on Land's End for 10 years because I was in another business than we, and we had access to the same kind of, 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 of clothing. But it wasn't, it wasn't as good. It wasn't, it wasn't the value that Land's End has. And so I came back. They didn't dump me from the from their database. My password still worked. Good for them. And I've been buying since the 70s. Maybe I'm their most loyal customer. But most RFM analyses don't figure that out. Can't figure it out. So we know people are going out the bottom, but it's hard to tell who is really out and who's just scum around the drain, but really still in the bathtub. John taught me this stuff. So I wanted to give an homage to John. I got more stuff. I got more to talk about, but we got to turn this off at some point. So I want to, I want to say goodbye to John, a great man. <laughs> I tried to talk him into, <laughs> into selling cheap tools, <laughs> having a division that was. He, he, I told him about the circle saw that I, that I bought. And he said, that won't, that won't last 24, 24 hours of operation. It'll be dead. And I just built a swing set with it. And I thought to myself, well, how much did I use it? To, to, a big swing set built from scratch, from, from real lumber. And uh, I thought, how much did I really, you know, zing off, zing off. <laughs> how many seconds did I use that thing? I thought, my goodness, I probably didn't use it five minutes, maybe ten. Okay, so I've got 23 hours and 50 minutes left to go on the life of it, and I haven't used it another ten minutes since I did it. <laughs> so I said to John, well, you know, in comparison to the craftsman and uh, what other, uh, other junk he didn't like, and I don't remember which, um, I said, why don't you do studies and decide which ones of the junky ones are the better or worse it would it would help the industry uh, but he didn't he said I don't want to sell that junk He's, he wanted to sell it to serious people who are actually going to use the tools I said that's a huge mistake we did work for Chicago cutlery and I told Chicago cutlery for every one chef who really wants a good knife and the, the irony is you know, I've talked to a lot of chefs, and I've talked to a lot of butchers and, and other people who use knives daily. 
And what they came, what conclusion I've come to is, it's better to have a cheap knife that you don't care about grinding the steel off to keep it really sharp than it is to have a Henkel that you're afraid to sharpen because you're going to wear it out. And you don't wear them out. So now I sharpen them mercilessly, and I don't care if they're going to be a little sliver of a blade by the time my kids inherit them. And I can't see that there's any removed metal anyway. But anyway, so I said for every one chef, there's a, there's ten people that would like to would like to look like a chef. And I said, and I said, so that's your big market. And that really was. I first was hired by Ernie Shell to go down and and meet John, and you know he was he he had grown so much, and it was like, well, we can grow a lot more. And I thought, no, you can't. <laughs> How many serious woodworkers are there in the world? And sure enough, he grew he grew tenfold at least after I thought there wasn't much growth left. We were doing a valuation of his company, I think, and you know he just smoked me. <laughs> Which, again, is why you need an old guy who's been through it, who can tell you. There's 20 times bigger market than you've got. And you know what? The worst case scenarios I'm seeing are 20% reduction. I had this this home inspector friend, and he he said he was ready to shut his business down. Because in the winter, nobody's buying and selling houses in Milwaukee. And I said, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. I said. In the grand scheme of things, how much business do you have in the city of Milwaukee compared to all the business available? And we made a little dot. I said, and let's say this is all of the, uh, the, the boom times in the spring or whatever it is. And now we cut off 30% of it. I erased it with my marker board. I said, so are you saying that inside of that 30% less market, there isn't enough business for you to go after to replace the 30% you lost. And he said, what? I said, you know, because people are still going to want to eat, <laughs> eat out. People are still going to need to segment their customers. It's just that, that maybe they won't have as many choices. So in some, in some cases, Bob Franzblow, uh, Thompson Cigar. I wonder how Bob's doing. I met him at a conference, and 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 his his uh, his daughter had been in one of my classes, and I said, "Hey, Bob, you know, great to see you." But this was after the, the cigar boom had passed, when you could buy cigars in any gas station in Wisconsin, anyway. And he said, "I said, how are you know how's business now that they're legislating cigar stores out of existence?" And he said, best year ever, which shows you if you're the last man standing, you get all the business, right? And that's what Ritson's article is about. He said, the early bird doesn't get the worm. The one who stays up all night and figures out where the worms are coming from and puts the electrode in the ground gets all the worms. That's what we're talking about here in coronavirus. If you can figure out how to mail profitably right now, you can crush your competition. You know, don't hoard your money. Go out and get customers. This may go on a couple more months. You think, oh, I can't wait. I mean, I can't. I got to pull back. I got to pull back. Okay. That is the way to go out of business. There's more business out there than you can imagine right now. Everybody wants to buy. My clients that are mailing are going berserk. Anyway, you owe it to your customers. Maybe we don't mail so deep. Maybe we mail more creatively. Get a guy who's been through a few pandemics. Can help you out. Anyway, John Worth taught me a super a lot about life. Right? Super a lot. Oh, and back to my home builder. So he called me back a couple of months, two months later. I said, well, how did it go in January? He said, not only was January my best January, because of your speech, my little five-minute speech, he said, January was the biggest month I ever had. All he did was buy donuts, go visit the banks, go visit the lawyers, the real estate lawyers, go visit realtors, bring donuts, say, I'm still here. If you need a home inspected, that's all he did. 
just go visit his regular customers who said, oh, good. Not everybody's around right now. He said, I know, but I still am. Have some donuts. That's all he did. Best month ever. There's business out there. People want to buy. We can help you. Thanks for the heart. I saw one go by. I'm John Miglosh. Like and share. <laughs> Your friends will think you're smart. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye.